Hi students, uh, we had an issue with the media site recording this week, uh, so I'm providing uh, this lecture again. I'm recording this lecture from my laptop here, and we're just going to go through the conquest and settlement here uh, so that it's accessible for people who want to watch it again and for the distance learning students. So I'm just going to move uh, this into the slideshow mode and then we'll be ready to go. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the aftermath of the Age of Exploration. We're going to talk about the ways in which the Spanish settle into uh, these new lands and start to establish uh, control and political influence within the new lands that they've discovered in the New World. And we'll also look at the ongoing expansion of the Portuguese Empire. When Columbus returns to Europe, uh, the Spanish monarchs are excited to see him. They give him more resources, more ships, more money uh, to conduct further voyages of exploration in the New World. Uh, in his last voyage, he comes across a giant uh, river estuary. Um, and typically, when you have a large river that's uh, putting out into the sea, that's a sign you've reached a substantial landmass. And up until that point, Columbus had only come in contact with islands. And so Columbus uh, went to his grave convinced that he had reached uh, that he had reached Asia. And now the Portuguese want to claim uh, want to claim control over the lands that the Spanish have started discovering. They appeal to an old edict from the popes who had said that the Portuguese kind of had carte blanche to go out and evangelize all the new lands that were being discovered. And the Portuguese say this is going to apply to these lands the Spanish are discovering as well. And the Spanish say not so fast. And so the Portuguese and the Spanish are in competition about this. And in the end, they take their concerns to the papacy. And the Pope at the time is Alexander VI, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And so they ask Alexander VI to work out uh, some kind of resolution to this rivalry. And the resolution that Alexander proposes is called the Treaty of Tordesillas, posed in 1494. And this treaty divided the world along the dotted purple line that you see on your map here. And uh, basically, the, treaty, the terms of the treaty were anything that was west of the line, uh, modern day Americas, that's going to be Spanish sphere of influence. Anything that's east of the line, that's going to be Portuguese sphere of influence. And the later treaty, the Treaty of Sargossa, which we're not going to talk about now, out of the green line over here um, so that you knew where east ended and, and west began. When this treaty is proposed, the Portuguese say, OK, we're fine with this. Can you just move the line a couple of degrees of latitude to the west? And that's this uh, dark purple line here. And the Spanish are willing to agree to that. Everything that Columbus has discovered so far is over here in the West Indies and in the Caribbean. Uh, about six years after the Treaty of Tordesillas, uh, a Portuguese explorer named Cabral discovers Brazil. And so, and it turns out that Brazil is going to fall on the right side of the line for the Portuguese. And that's why even today, Brazil is the only country in South America uh, where Portuguese is the national language rather than Spanish. There's a really cool conspiracy theory, uh, and I don't know if it's supported by any evidence, but it suggests that the Portuguese already knew about Brazil and they were just keeping this secret. And there's a lot of secrecy and a lot of spy craft that went into these voyages of exploration and not telling uh, your rivals what you had discovered. And spies would be in the harbors when these ships would come in, would take sailors out to try and get them drunk and tell them what they discovered. So it is possible that the Portuguese had made this discovery and just hadn't told anyone about it. Like I say, there's no evidence for it, but I find it a fun theory. The reason that the Treaty of Tordesillas is going to be significant is that it's going to kind of set in stone these two different imperial models that the Portuguese and the Spanish are going to pursue. For the Portuguese, their empire, such as it is, is going to follow the model that we discussed last week. They're going to have small areas, small enclaves down the coast of Africa, um, along the east coast of Africa and into India, where they have trading relationships with the local peoples. And so this is going to be primarily a trading empire. The Spanish, on the other hand, are going to develop uh, an empire that's much more land based and much more focused on uh, territorial control and political rule. 
The last voyage that we're going to talk about in this class, the last voyage of discovery, is uh, Ferdinand Magellan's voyage. So this is a significant voyage because it's the first time that someone had sailed all around the world. The reason that Magellan takes this voyage is to show that the Spice Islands over here were part of Spanish territory according to the Treaty of Tordesillas. He sails down the coast of South America until he finds the Straits of Magellan which uh, are a cut through, which mean you don't have to go all the way to Antarctica in order to sail around South America. It looks pretty short on the map. This is actually 300 miles long. 300 miles is some of the most difficult sailing because it's a long way, quarters are, are cramped, uh, it's increasingly cold, the landscape is increasingly barren, and this was a pretty frightening experience for uh, Magellan's crew. And after they reach the other side, they have to cross the Pacific Ocean. Uh, they do this um, in some discomfort because they're starting to run out of provisions. Uh, the sailors are suffering from this disease called scurvy, which is a disease that you get if you don't have enough uh, fresh fruit and vegetables and enough vitamins. And it's pretty unpleasant. Your gums kind of swell up over your teeth. Um, and at the end, you can die. Um, and so Magellan and his crew, those who survive, make it to the Philippines, the Spice Islands. Uh, here, Magellan is very successful in establishing relations with one king who agrees to become baptized and to become a Christian. Uh, but on another island, there's miscommunication. A riot breaks out and Magellan ends up getting killed. However, one of the other officers is able to get one of the remaining boats home with uh, just 18 survivors still on board. Now, this uh, over here is a photo of the Straits of Magellan, and obviously this isn't the boat that Magellan used, but I've included it here because I think it symbolizes why Magellan's voyage is significant. Uh, to me, it epitomizes uh, the rise of European influence throughout the world. Um, and we see that now with an American aircraft carrier, but that's in some ways directly related to, uh, to what Magellan had achieved. Uh, and what the European explorers were, achieve, uh, were achieving. Then from this point onwards, basically people anywhere in the world could expect to come into contact with uh, Europeans and their, the expansion of their influence uh, all, throughout, uh, all throughout the globe. I'm going to turn first of all to the Portuguese who are establishing their own empire that often gets forgotten about in the Indian Ocean. Um, and as I said, this is more of a trading empire. And as early as 1503, the Portuguese are kind of starting to flex their muscle. They're going to use the guns that they have mounted on their ships uh, to force um, political change that's going to be advantageous to them. You know, to support uprisings uh, in order to put a new ruler into power is going to be more favorable to them. Or to support the current ruler in power if they're already favorable to them. Um, and so they pretty much gained control of the Indian Ocean and the Muslim rulers of India at the time turned to the Ottoman Turks to help them. And the Ottoman Turks have a more sophisticated navy that's better able to go toe to toe uh, with uh, the Portuguese. And in one of the first conflicts, they surprise the Portuguese and defeat them. <clears throat> However, the Portuguese regroup and at the Battle of Diu in 1509, led by a man named Manuel Almeida, the Portuguese are able to totally defeat uh, the Ottoman Turks. And this is a really important battle in the history of the world that, as I say, often gets forgotten about because it secures Portuguese control of the Indian Ocean. It halts the expansion of Islamic influence into the Indian Ocean. And looking further forward, it secures European control of the Indian Ocean. When the Portuguese Empire starts to weaken, it's going to be replaced by the British Empire. So for the next 400 years, 450 years, uh, this region is going to be dominated by European influences. And we see that uh, with the Portuguese, who in the next year complete their conquests of uh, Goa and uh, uh, which is over here, and Malacca, and uh, Hormuz, which is up here, and establish this perimeter around the Indian Ocean that enables them to carry out trade with all these different regions and to become extremely uh, wealthy. It becomes a very important source of wealth for the Portuguese. Now we're going to turn our attention back to the Spanish, and we're going to turn to the narrative of Hernan Cortes and the Aztec Empire. 
Uh, by 1500, the Aztec Empire was extremely large um, and extremely wealthy and extremely sophisticated. We estimate that this was a population of five to six million people, um, and that Tenochtitlan, which is the uh, which is the capital of the empire, had a population of 140,000. That would have made it one of the largest cities in the world at the time, and certainly larger than any city in Europe. Despite its sophistication, this was a society that was totally committed to the practice of human sacrifice as a part of their religion. It's difficult for us to put a really accurate estimate on how many human sacrifices we're talking about here, but I uh, am very confident in telling you that if we say 50 to 60,000 a year, uh, that's a conservative estimate. It's probably almost certainly not going to be less than that. Hernan Cortes had grown up the son of a wealthy family in Spain. Uh, his parents wanted him to have a, sort of a Renaissance humanistic education and take up a career in law. Um, as we've kind of talked about in the past, Cortes wasn't really interested in that. He was initially a sickly child, but by the time he was a teenager, uh, we're told that he was uh, robust, uh, mischievous, and ruthless. These are the characteristics that are typically associated with him. Uh, he comes to the New World in 1503, so about 10 years after Columbus first discovers the Americas, uh, and he uh, is about 18 years old at the time, and over the next 13 years, he's going to take time building up a reputation as an administrator. In 1518, he launches an invasion of uh, the Aztec Empire with a force of about 500 men. Now, did Cortes plan to take on and conquer the whole Aztec Empire? It's possible, but it seems unlikely. Was this some kind of crusade against human sacrifice? Uh, it doesn't seem as though that was the plan from the beginning, although it does seem as though the more the Spanish come into contact with uh, this practice of the Aztecs, the more the concerned they become about it. We, of course, know the end of this story, that the Spanish are going to be successful. How is it that the Spanish were able to conquer such a large empire with such a small force? And we have to talk about the advantages that the Spanish had. They had steel armor and they had steel weapons. Uh, steel was a technology that the Aztecs were not familiar with. It meant that the Spanish were better protected and that their weapons were more devastating. <clears throat> they also had horses which are not native in uh, the Americas. And so these were large and terrifying for the Aztecs and provided the Spanish with an important advantage. They also had firearms. Firearms are not such a, a huge advantage as we might think, because at this time they were still pretty unreliable. They could blow up in your face. They could only maintain a certain rate of fire. But that still added to the intimidation factor of uh, the Spanish um, and gave them an advantage as well. The most important advantage that the Spanish hold is their Native American allies. And so by the time that Cortes arrives in Tenochtitlan for the first time, he is backed by several thousand uh, Native American allies. Uh, and this is really important because Cortes' expedition is often framed as a sort of proto-colonial invasion and destruction of uh, a sophisticated empire. Aztecs were certainly sophisticated, but it's important to remember that even though these Native Americans didn't know a whole lot about the Spanish, um, they saw them as a significant improvement over the Aztecs, who they increasingly saw as, um, uh, well, maybe they had seen them as this way for a long time, but as a totalitarian and uh, a dangerous, um, dangerous rulers. The Spanish are initially driven out of Tenochtitlan. Cortes returns with a much larger army. Now we're talking about over 20,000 soldiers. And again, the vast, vast majority of them, uh, at least 20,000, are going to be Native American allies. And after a long campaign, they captured Tenochtitlan and the Spanish have defeated the Aztec emperors. And we'll talk more about what that means in the next video.